Right. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. All right, well, last week in our study in John's Gospel, we finished chapter 20, which ended with verses 30 and 31. Let me read them. And truly, Jesus did many other signs, miracles, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, i got to tell you, John could have ended his gospel with those words, and it would have been a powerful ending. Okay, That, to me, would have been powerful. But instead, he chooses to add a, an epilogue or a postscript, which we call chapter 21. And uh, this has caused many to wonder why John didn't finish his book with that dramatic ending in verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20, but instead felt the need to add another chapter. Now, it's not a great mystery. I think it's pretty obvious, many others do too, that John did not want to end his gospel without telling his readers that Peter had been restored to his apostleship. I mean, think about it. If John would have ended with verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20, end of the gospel, we turn the page and we see Peter, so predominant in the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, many would have been left to go, what happened? Last time I saw the guy, last time John wrote, except for that little uh, a little uh, part uh, uh, in chapter 20 where John and Peter had run to the tomb early that Sunday morning because the women said the tomb was empty and he had risen, so they ran there. But really, Peter doesn't say anything. Uh, the last time we really saw Peter mentioned in John's gospel was in chapter 18. And that was when... In the morning that Jesus was crucified, as Jesus was inside the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, being interrogated um, by the Jewish high council, the Sanhedrin, Peter was outside with the Romans soldiers in the courtyard and um, denying his Lord. And that really was the last time we saw him. Now, again, if John had included chapter 21... Uh, which tells us how the Lord restored Peter back to fellowship with himself and back to his apostleship. We wouldn't understand, again, how he was so became so prominent in the book of Acts as a leader in the early church. But guys, not only that, this chapter teaches us some very important lessons about the love of, excuse me, about true love, which is the love of God, and how it works its way out of our lives to touch others around us. And so this section is defining true love from God's perspective, and it could be applied to our marriages or to any real, any other human relationship that we have as Christians. So uh, I'm just going to start with the first point of our outline, uh, the first main point, and it just is true love is not words, it is a commitment. True love is not words, it is a commitment. Let's look at verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's just another term for the Sea of Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, which of course we know are James and John, and two, other, two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. It appears to me that Peter was given up and going back to his old life, the life that Jesus had called him away from three and a half years earlier when Jesus told him he was going to make Peter a fisher of men. When Peter said, I'm going fishing, I believe what he was really saying is, I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to fishing. Guys, it was an exciting three years, okay? Uh, a lot of fun, a lot of ups and downs, roller coaster ride. But you know what? It's over. Where's Jesus? 
Uh, we don't even know where he's gone. Look, um, it's over. It's time to go back to our old lives and careers. I'm going fishing. And being the natural born leader that he was, the other disciples responded in verse 3, well, we are going with you also. So verse 3, they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? Now, anyone who has ever fished knows that when you're out there fishing and somebody walks up or floats by in another boat, what do they ask you? You caught anything? Everybody does that. So Jesus, you know, basically says, hey, guys, have you caught any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw in it in the rope, the net, because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's always John's way of referring to himself. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Let me stop and make an observation. There is uh, quite a difference between self-directed service for God and God-directed service for God. Service that is directed by the Lord is always, always going to be fruitful. Maybe not as fruitful as you would like, but the fruit, fruit will definitely be forthcoming. Um, so often, that which we do for the Lord in our ministries uh, well, is often fruitless and frustrating. Why is that? Because often we haven't really prayed about it. We've just dove in and we just decide we're going to do something for the Lord that we think is a good idea. And uh, we start doing it and uh, maybe it's a good ministry, but it's not a ministry God's directing you to do, at least maybe not at that moment. And so you get in there with all the excitement and energy and you quickly burn out, and it's very fruitless, very frustrating. It's because God-directed service is what the church needs today. So many Christians are doing what they think is right, and then asking God to bless it, when they should be seeking the Lord and letting God direct what He wants them to be doing for Him. You know, my pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, who founded Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California, uh, back in 1965. He's with the Lord now. But Chuck gave his testimony several times, and uh, I've, I've heard it several times uh, that he's given it. And um, he said that for 17, the first 17 years of his ministry, he never pastored churches more than 100 people. He said, when I got into ministry i had graduated bible college got into ministry and i had all kinds of good ideas for the lord all kinds of energy i couldn't wait to turn the world upside down for our savior and so chuck labored and he labored and he labored for 17 years and there was really no fruit to show for it he was almost ready to leave the ministry altogether and go work at a sec secular company serving the lord because he was not going to not do that but you know, get out of ministry altogether because he felt like a failure. At that time, Chuck was involved in a denomination, Foursquare Church, and they had an annual meeting uh, at a hotel somewhere. And uh, uh, so Chuck went, and the overseer of the area, they call him a bishop, he was the overseer, um, presented the new program for the spring section of the spring semester. Chuck said that was the thing. For 17 years, that's all we did was programs and gimmicks and little things, uh, man-made little things that were designed to bring people into the church. Never worked. And so, you know, the bishops up there trying to whip up the, the guys and, and laying out this great new program and then, you know, kind of a cheerleading uh, pep rally kind of a atmosphere and at one point he says now who's with me stand up and everybody shot up to their feet cheering and Chuck just sat there 
I, he just, I couldn't go another program. I was just born, burned out. And so afterward, the bishop walked over and lectured Chuck on the evils of rebellion. And, uh, you know, and so Chuck went back to his hotel room and knelt by his bed, broken. And said, Lord, you know, they got me pegged as a rebel. You know I'm not a rebel. I just can't go another contest. I can't do it, Lord. And Chuck said, the Lord spoke to me very clearly. He gave me two scriptures. The first one, it's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And the second one out of Acts chapter 2, and the Lord added to the church daily those being saved. He got up from there, and at that Around that time, God was speaking to Chuck about teaching his word verse by verse. And so he went back to his church and began to just teach the word verse by verse. As he did, a remarkable thing began to happen. People started to come. The church doubled in size, then quadrupled to the point at the end of the spring semester, because they had to fill out and send in Attendance reports, the denomination required that. He gets a letter from the, before emails and stuff, he gets a letter from the bishop telling him, Chuck, congratulations, you won the contest. And we want you to come to this meeting where we can present you with the trophy. Chuck wrote him back and said, well, it would be, Weird for uh, our church to accept a trophy, seeing that nobody knew about the contest. We didn't participate in the contest. All we did was teach the word verse by verse. And so he threw that letter away and just kept teaching the word, and the church kept growing and growing until finally they had to buy a piece of property. And while a new church was being built, they had to, to buy a circus tent Giants, you can go online and see all this. In fact, at the end of February, a movie's coming out. Maybe you've heard about it. Jesus Revolution? About this period. Spoken through the eyes of Greg Laurie, who was right there in the thick of it. Calvary started in 65, and right, uh, uh, right after Chuck took over and started to teach verse by verse, the church started exploding. And it's interesting how this movie is coming out now, right? So Chuck, he had the, they buy this big giant circus tent, and Saturday night guys are wiring lights in it, and they're setting up folding chairs, and there's a sea of 1,500 folding chairs in this tent. And Chuck's young son, Chuck Jr., said, Dad, how long do you think it's going to take God to fill these seats? Chuck looked at his watch and said, about 12 hours. The next morning, every seat was taken, and it was standing room only. After the service, Chuck Jr. walked up and said, Dad, what is going on? And Chuck said, Son, understand this. This is totally the grace of God. It is not me. Years later, when Pastor Chuck was teaching a group of us pastors about success in the ministry, he went on to make this point using John 21. And he said, whenever, talking to pastors now, whenever the nets of ministry get so full that you can't draw them in, you know there is only one explanation for it, and that is, it is the Lord. You start taking credit for what God's doing, he'll put you on a shelf so fast, it'll make your head spin. I've seen it with guys. Now, let me remind you that something very similar that we read in John 21, verses 5 and 6, something very similar took place three and a half years earlier, okay? Um, when Jesus first called these men to leave their fishing nets and follow him, promising to make them fishers of men, something that was not lost to John. Turn to Luke 5.
And let's read verses 1 to 11, because this is important. So Luke 5, verse 1, so it was, now this is, three, this is when Jesus was first starting his ministry, right? And so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, another name for the Sea of Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. So the crowd was so large, and they were pressing close to him to the point where they were going to knock him into the, into the water, that he sees a couple of boats sitting there, climbs into one, and has Peter, was in that boat, row out a little bit so he could teach the crowd from the water because they were just so, so big. So two boats standing there, fishermen had gone out washing their nets, verse 3. And when he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets, plural, for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Now, here's what Peter's saying. Rabbi, you're a great teacher, but we're fishermen. And you don't catch fish in the deep during the day. You catch fish in the shallow waters at night. But that's what you want me to do. I will launch out into the deep and let down what? The net. Jesus said, let down your nets for a catch. Okay, well, all right, but not going to work, but I'll let down the net. So often we limit how God wants to use us and bless us because we don't go all out. We, we pull back. We are hindering in some way. We're not ready to, to make a full commitment or whatever it might be. If the Lord tells you to let down the nets, you let down the nets. Anyways, so they let down the net. Um, verse 6, And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and the net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners uh, in the other boats. It was... Uh, Peter and Andrew, brothers, were partners with James and John, brothers as well, okay, in this fishing business. So they called James and John over, give us a hand. Uh, we, the boat is sinking because there's so many fish in this net. Um, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished. This was a miracle, obviously. Were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. That was three and a half years ago. Jesus called these guys away from their secular jobs to serve Jesus full-time in ministry. Well, as this scene unfolds, John remembers this is exactly what happened three and a half years ago, right? Therefore, verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, and we don't know how John said it. Did he say, uh-oh, it's the Lord. He told us to wait. In Jerusalem, but here we are. Or maybe it was just raw excitement. Peter, it's the Lord. Now when Simon, Peter, heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and I like this, plunged into the sea. I like that. It was just diving. He plunged in, whatever. But the other disciples came in the little, little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, or about 300 um, feet. They came dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. By the time they reached the shore, Jesus had already prepared, already prepared breakfast for them of charcoal fish and bread for the hungry uh, disciples, the uh, fishermen that weren't very successful. 
One commentator said, and I quote, All night long the disciples had been looking for fish, while all the while Jesus had it right at hand, freshly grilled, ready to eat. Jesus had their breakfast already, broiled fish and bread. We do not know whether the Lord caught these fish or whether he obtained them miraculously, but we do learn that he is not dependent on our poor efforts. Jesus had called these men into full-time ministry three and a half years earlier, but here they are worried about providing for themselves and their families, so they leave the ministry and try to provide their own food. And then he quotes what Jesus said when he said, look, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else you need to live in the physical, God will take care of. Don't worry about your physical daily needs. You serve me. Put the kingdom above everything else. Work for me in building the kingdom. I'll take care of your basic needs, right? The author concludes, Doubtless in heaven we shall learn that while many people were saved through preaching and personal witness, many others were saved by the Lord himself without any human help. End quote. Sometimes skeptics will say, um, what about the native way, way deep in the, you know, Africa, so deep, you know, removed from civilizations that no missionary can ever get to them. You're going to tell me God's going to send them to hell for not believing in Jesus when they never even had a chance. Let me tell you something. First of all, nobody is without a witness. Because the creation declares the glory of God, the firmament shows forth his handiwork, day into day utter speech, night into night preach knowledge. The creation is preaching an ever is a universal gospel to everybody that there is a God, he exists, and anybody in the simplicity of their heart who looks into nature or looks up at the night sky and sees all these things and knows this could not have happened by accident. There has to be a divine being who made it all, and I would sure love to know who he is. God will get that person with the information they need to be saved. God never sends anyone to hell that wants to know the truth. If he has to, he'll even send an angel to that tribe, and he has done it. I've heard testimonies about that very thing. And I know in Revelation, maybe chapter 7, 14, or 14, at one point God dispatches an angel to fly through the heavens and declare the everlasting gospel to every person on planet Earth so that nobody can say, I never heard, I never had a chance. And if he'll do that in the future, why couldn't he have done that in the past many times? So when we get to heaven, we're going to see a lot of people there that no missionary ever talked to. Because God will make sure that if a person is hungry to know the truth, to know him, he'll make sure they get the truth. But this is interesting, interesting to me. The fire of coals, you read in chapter 21, um, verse 9, when they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it, right? Uh, here, this fire of coals, at least to me, is reminiscent of the fire of coals that the Roman soldiers had started to warm themselves in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest, the morning of Jesus' crucifixion. Now, you remember that Peter had also warmed himself by that very fire as Jesus was inside being interrogated, actually being put through a mock trial, at the house of Caiaphas. This whole scene must have stirred Peter's memory because it was early that morning standing by that fire, a, coal, a fire of coals, that Peter denied his Lord three times. And I don't think for a second, guys, this was a coincidence. I think this was orchestrated by Jesus. I believe Jesus purposely planned this meeting with Peter this way because he wanted to deal with Peter's love and commitment to him before restoring him both to himself, Peter to Jesus, and to the ministry. Now, we'll really look at that exchange next week, but I just want to continue because there are things here that we need to learn about true love, God's love. So verse 9, 
As soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, let me make a few other observations from this text. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught, right? Notice that although Jesus already had fish laid on coals, cooking before they even got to shore, right? Um, for the breakfast that he was going to feed them there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he also asked them for some of the fish which they had caught. Who provided those fish? Jesus did. Okay. Um, they didn't actually, they, they didn't do anything. The fish appeared in the net and they dragged it in. But Jesus, very gracious, says, uh, look, I've got some fish already cooking, but you know, bring some of the ones that you've just caught. I'll add it to the, okay? Guys, even though he didn't need their help when it came to catching fish, <laughs> he accepts their contribution. He accepts their contribution. Guys, when it comes to serving the Lord, <laughs> Guess what? He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. But he still directs and accepts our service for him. Why? Because he loves us and loves to work with us. You know, when my uh, boys were little guys, I don't know, maybe seven and four, I'd be out in the garage, uh, you know, on a nice summer's day and got the garage door open. I'm doing some stuff and some... some uh, you know, just doing some chores out there or building something. And here they would come. Daddy, Daddy, uh, we want to help you. Now look, I didn't need their help. I could have done the job faster without their help. But I always enjoyed letting them help me. Why? Because I wanted to spend time with them. I wanted to spend time with them. I think that's the way it works with God. doesn't need us. Pastor Chuck used to say angels would do a much better job than we do in serving God. But he loves us. He loves to spend time with us. And it's just a beautiful picture of our loving Heavenly Father. Uh, Abba, Father. That's what little kids say to their father. Because in his eyes, he wants us to be like little children in our faith, in our love, and so on. Um, but again, verse uh, uh, chapter 21, verse 10, Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not broken. Why does the Holy Spirit writing through John make it a point to tell us exactly how many fish were in the net? Oh, I don't know. Does it matter? I think everything matters in the Bible. I don't think anything is there by accident. Jesus said every jot and tittle was put there by the Holy Spirit. We would say every dot of the I, cross of the T, the smallest markings in the Hebrew alphabet, jots and tittles, crosses of the T, dot of the I in the English, the smallest, was Jesus' way of saying nothing is in the Word of God that is unimportant. Everything matters. So with that in mind, why did the Holy Spirit make it a point to write through John the exact number of fish in that net? Now I'm going to go, I'm not going to let you wonder, I don't know. I don't know. But one author had this to say. He said, The Bible gives the exact number of fish in the net, 153. 
Many interesting ex explanations have been offered as to the as to the meaning of this number. Um, some say the number it was uh, the number of languages in the world at that time. Others say it was the number of races or tribes in the world toward which the gospel net would be spread out. Others say the number is the number of it's the number of different kinds of fish in the Sea of Galilee, or maybe in the world. There is no doubt. Uh, there is no doubt that it speaks of the variety of those who would be saved through through, uh, through the preaching of the gospel from every tribe and nation. So it represents all the different kinds of fish in the world, which represents all the ways that you know all the different kind of people we're gonna, you know, as fishes of men, catch for the kingdom. The author says the fishermen knew that it was remarkable that the net had not broken. This is further evidence that God's work carried out in God's way will never lack God's resources. He will see that the net or the work does not break, does not, you know, does not end, and so on. It will, he'll make sure it's successful. Look, verse 12 has to be one of the most cryptic and troubling verses in the Bible. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. As we read the Gospels and the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, nobody who saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ recognized him at first. Mary didn't recognize him. The morning of his resurrection, as she stood by the, the uh, tomb, the empty tomb weeping. Now people say, well, her eyes were swollen because of she was crying. That's why she didn't wreck it. She thought it was the gardener. But, but her eyes were all swollen and so on. The disciples on the road to Emmaus that resurrection Sunday afternoon, they didn't recognize him even as he walked with them the seven miles to uh, Emmaus. And they only recognized it was Jesus when he sat at the table and broke bread, and they probably saw the nail prints in his hands, we assume. And then their eyes were opened, they knew it was Jesus. We just read in verse 4 of John 21, when Jesus appeared that morning on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, they didn't know it was Jesus, the disciples. Well, it was early morning, there was a mist coming up out of the Sea of Galilee, we, we hear, and it kind of was, was kind of hindering their vision. Okay. Verse 12 nails it. Verse 12 really indicates something wasn't right about his appearance. What was it? Why didn't those who were Jesus, listen, closest followers, why didn't they recognize him after his resurrection? Well, we all know that after his resurrection, he still bore the marks of his crucifixion. We know that because he showed his disciples, the nail prints in his hands and the spear wound in his side, uh, it, it, as they were gathered in the upper room the Sunday evening of his resurrection. I, was, I believe it was because he had been beaten so badly before his crucifixion, the aftermath which he still bore in his res, on his resurrected, glorified body, that they couldn't recognize him. We know that when he returned to heaven, he still bore the marks of his, of his crucifixion. Because when John is taken to heaven and sees a vision of God's throne room in Revelation 5, we read in verse 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, of the, of, uh, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, speaking of Jesus Christ, as though it had been slain. So even in heaven, John sees Jesus bearing the marks of his crucifixion. The first time we lay eyes on him, as we as, we as Christians are raptured and finally see him face to face, Isaiah 53 verse 2 tells us, There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. And then earlier in Isaiah 52 verse 14 but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, 
he seemed hardly human, and from his appearance one would scarcely know he was a man. They beat Jesus so mercilessly. We don't really get this from the Gospels. They beat him so mercilessly and disfigured him so badly, Isaiah tells us, he no longer even looked human. He didn't even look like a human being. In fact, Isaiah says that when we finally see him, we will turn our face away and it will be so shocking. We won't be able to look at him initially. Furthermore, when Jesus returns to the earth after the tribulation, at his second coming to establish his kingdom, he will still be bearing the marks of his crucifixion because Zechariah 12 verse 10 tells us that as he's returning, they, the Jewish people primarily, will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn. You say, how long will he bear the marks of his crucifixion? I don't know. Maybe for all eternity. Paul says something interesting in Ephesians 2 verse 7. That in ages yet to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It could be that Jesus Christ will bear the marks of his crucifixion for all eternity. And that initially we're, we'll be so shocked and horrified we'll turn away. But after we get used to seeing him that way, every time we see him for all eternity, it's going to provoke such love in our hearts that he was willing to go through all of that, that I might be saved, that you might be saved. So let me just say this, and I don't know if I'm right. I hope I'm not. Your first glimpse of Jesus Christ could very possibly be a very shocking experience. So prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Now, what was the these that Jesus was referring to? And I've heard three possibilities, okay? I mean, we don't know what he was pointing to. Do you love me more than these? And we, we weren't there to see what he was pointing to. Three possible explanations or, you know, ideas about what it was. He could have been pointing to the boat and the nets and asking Peter, do you love me more than your chosen profession? In other words, I called you away from that three and a half years ago. And here you are, you've gone back to it. Do you love this profession? Of, of fishing more than you love me. He could have been pointing to the fish. You mean pointing to the fish? He could have been pointing to the fish and asking Peter, do you love me more than success and material prosperity? Or number three, this is the one I lean toward. Jesus could have been pointing to the other disciples, reminding Peter of how he, Peter, had promised, though these, these other disciples, deny you, I will never deny you. Because I love you more than them. They don't love you as much as I do, Lord. Because I'm telling you, I love you so much, I would never deny you. Peter had verbalized his love and commitment to Jesus, his love for and commitment to Jesus on the night before, his crucifixion in the upper room. It was then that he made a promise to his Lord that he would be loyal to Jesus even if it cost Peter his life. Even if they kill me, I will not deny you. He would never deny his Lord. That was Peter's promise. And yet we all know that it was a promise he failed to make good on. It was a promise, even with the best intentions, he failed to keep. Guys, true love, and I'm talking about God's love, of course, doesn't just tell people they love them with words only. True love demonstrates that love by 
their commitment. You don't just tell somebody you love them. You show it. You show it through a commitment, first of all, right? A commitment to help them, provide for them, you know, be there for them no matter what. John picked up on this, maybe thinking of Peter and what Jesus said to Peter here in chapter 21 of his gospel. John writes about this in his first epistle. Turn to 1 John 3. And let me read this to you out of the NLT. And again, I'm not so sure John didn't have Peter in mind and what Jesus said to Peter um, that morning that John writes about in chapter 21. 1 John 3, verse 16. I'll read it to you out of the NLT. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought, to give, also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sis, Christian brother or sister is the idea, uh, sees them in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let, let us show the truth by our actions. Please listen to me. Just because Peter failed to keep his promise to the Lord by denying him, it didn't mean that Peter's verbal declaration of love for Jesus was a lie. didn't mean that. I mean, part of the restoration process was for Jesus to teach Peter that saying you love someone and promising to be faithful to them is great. Words are important. But if it's not backed up with actions, commitment, it really is meaningless. It's as meaningless as the wedding ring. Now, a wedding ring is a symbol of, a, of the promise you and your spouse made to each other on your wedding day that you were going to love each other and be faithful, loyal to each other for the rest of your lives, right? That's a promise. The, that wedding ring symbolizes a promise. And yet it's as, it's as meaningless, that wedding ring, it's as meaningless as it would be on the finger of an adulterer or an adulteress. And that is why I said earlier that the lessons in true love that this section in John 21 teaches can be applied, listen, to all our close re personal relationships, especially and in including and especially to our marriages. One of the greatest heartbreaks in life one of the greatest feelings of betrayal comes when the person we have pledged to love and be loyal to for the rest of our lives isn't faithful and loyal to us but breaks that pledge that vow that promise and commits adultery on us but listen even if your spouse fails to hold uh, to uphold the promise they made to you on your wedding day, again, to love you and be loyal to you until death do you part, it doesn't necessarily mean everything was a lie and they really don't love you after all. Please understand, I'm not trying to lessen the severity of their actions or make light of their unfaithfulness. What they did was incredibly selfish and hurtful. And it demonstrated that they loved themselves, at least at that moment when they were cheating, they loved themselves more than they love you. As evidenced by how they just put themselves first and satisfied their desire for sexual gratification instead of clinging to the promise they made to their spouse to be faithful for the rest of their lives. Marriage brings two people together and binds them together in such a way they become one. There is no other options. You remember in the book of Genesis, when God first, the first marriage, he made one man and one woman, right? There were no other people at this time. In the Bible, when an important doctrine 
appears the first time. It's called the law first mentioned in hermeneutics. Study that passage. It becomes the prototype for understanding that thing, whether it's atonement or worship or marriage, it teaches us what God says about this thing for the rest of Scripture. It's interesting that God created Adam and then Eve and married them when there wasn't any others to, they, it was not like they had an option. Well, I don't really like Eve. She's gained a little weight. I want Lilith, which doesn't exist, but there are those who believe that, you know, before Eve there was Lilith. I don't even go there. Anyways, but um, God was laying down a principle. One man, one woman for life. There was no option for divorce and remarriage. It's only two people. And look, If we were perfect people, and we're not, we'd always keep our promise to we, promises to each other, especially the promise we made to each other in marriage. And the same is true in our relationship with Jesus, our bridegroom. A lot of folks want to get really down on those who have been unfaithful to their spouse. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's virtuous by any means. But you know when you got one finger pointing at somebody, you got how many pointing back at you? How many times have we been unfaithful to our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, right? In our words, in our actions. We're unfaithful all the time in the way we think and talk and things we do. Yet we really expect Jesus to forgive us, and he does. And yet we harbor all this anger towards those who fail in their personal physical relationships guys we're all work in progress check out philippians 1 verse 6 and the more we draw close to jesus every day listen the more we're the more our commitment to him and to our spouse because they go kind of hand in hand the more we draw close to jesus every day the more our commitment to him and to our spouse will grow and also guys the more we draw close to jesus every day the less effective will be the enemy's temptation in our lives to be selfish and unfaithful in our marriage in our relationship first of all to jesus and then of course in our relationship with our spouse everything hinges on your walk with jesus getting close to jesus it's everything is bound up in that all i can say is when Peter was unfaithful to his Lord by denying him, he didn't realize that 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 didn't destroy his relationship with Jesus. It was only going to wind up making it stronger. You said, wait a minute, you lost me now. Are you saying what Peter did was a good thing? No. I'm just saying God can even take our mistakes, our sins, and teach us lessons that will make us better Christians in the end. We're all work in progress. And part of that is God is always teaching us, yes, even through our mistakes and failures and sins, important lessons that will help us to grow and to be more like Jesus, that we, that, so we walk closer with the Lord and don't make those same mistakes or commit those same sins in the future. I mean, through his moral failure, Peter learned a valuable lesson. And that is that the Christian life, either you're, if you're talking about your relationship directly with Jesus or, again, to your spouse. It can only be lived, the Christian life, lived in his strength, not in our strength. This is a lesson that Peter had to learn the hard way because Peter, in all sincerity, I believe, told Jesus that his love for him was stronger than the other disciples. He was a, a more devoted disciple, and even though they failed, he would never fail. What do we call that? We call that pride and self-confidence, self-reliance. God can't use us if we're proud, if we're putting all the emphasis on our strength. Lord, I can do it. Watch me work. God doesn't want us to make him promises based on our strength, the strength of our flesh. Because they're doomed to fail. That's why New Year's resolutions are a bad idea. Because you're making God or yourself promises 
based on your own strength. And folks, let me just tell you this one more time. You can't use the flesh to conquer the flesh. And that's what making a promise in your own strength is all about. The only way change is going to happen is if we first of all acknowledge we're weak, we don't try to make God promises we cannot keep, and we fall on our faces and say, Lord, I know I can't live this life unless you give me the strength. Because if you don't work in me and give me the strength, I know I can't be the husband you want me to be, the wife, the Christian, the servant, the parent, whatever. It's all based on your strength and so on. And guys, when Peter denied Jesus after promising him that even though the other disciples, you know, we're not going to cut it, and that he, Peter, would never deny him, when he finally did break that promise, I believe it broke Peter in a way that few of us understand, as evidenced by the fact he went out and wept bitterly. He sobbed convulsively for three days. I think Peter felt at that moment during those three days that he had damaged his relationship with Jesus so badly it was beyond repair. I have talked to people who think that because of whatever sin they had committed that was the final straw. They had damaged their relationship with Jesus to the point they could never, they could never be a follower of his ever again. I mean, you think about what Peter was thinking during those three days. I mean, how could Jesus ever forgive me? How could he ever want to spend time with me anymore? How could I ever be in service to him after what I did? I mean, denying I ever knew him? Not once, but three times? That's a sin I don't think I could, he'll ever forgive me for. And I believe, guys, that Peter thought his relationship with Jesus was over. I'm sure Peter felt he wants nothing more to do with me. And yet when Jesus rose from the dead... That Sunday morning, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, Peter was the first apostle Jesus sought out to restore him. Peter was about to learn that even when we fail the Lord and deny knowing him through our words, how many times have we done this? Hopefully, when you were a younger Christian, right? We denied knowing the Lord. Why? Because we don't want people to think we're Christian Bible thumpers and, you know, weirdos, Right? So one of our friends, we, is that a fish on your bumper? Are you a Christian? No, that, that was there. That's not my fish. You know? You don't want to come across, you know, you don't want the boss to know you're a evangelical, born-again Christian. They might not, he or she might not give you that promotion. And so on. So there's a lot of times we verbally have denied the Lord through our words, but also through our actions. I was telling first service that we had a guy in the church years ago who had gone to a church in California, Calvary, and he knew this guy real well. And this guy loved the Lord, and uh, you know, uh, but he had a problem with pornography. Now, in those days, you couldn't dial it up on the Internet. You had to actually go to the adult bookstore. So after church, he decides he's going to kind of slip off into this adult bookstore. Um, and he was in there for about an hour looking at the different magazines and things, as he's walking out, he looks down and realizes he's wearing his Jesus jacket. I had that very jacket, like a, like a windbreaker. It said in the back, Jesus or Jesus is alive, something like that. He realized that he had been wearing that the whole time he was in the adult bookstore. God used that to so break this man, it ended his addiction to pornography. So sometimes our sins can be used by God to make us better Christians. I think Peter's sin definitely made him a better servant. But I want you to know this as we, as we bring this to a close. Um, what Peter didn't realize for those three days, he was broken and weeping and, and devastated, thinking his relationship with Jesus was over, what he didn't understand at that moment was not only was his relationship with Jesus not over, his best days with Jesus and serving Jesus were yet future. And if you doubt that, turn the page, start reading the book of Acts. 
Peter's prominent in the first 12 chapters. Yeah, I know Peter broke his promise to Jesus. Who hasn't? Which one of us hasn't, right? But when he was weeping and broken for those three days, while Jesus was in the grave, what he didn't realize, though, what he didn't realize, which is what all of us need to realize, we are all going to fail Jesus. John said, if you say, I have no sin, you've deceived yourself. And the truth is not in you. That's something an unbeliever would say. We're all going to blow it. We're all going to be unfaithful to Jesus. The real lesson to take from this is, even though Peter and we fail Jesus, Jesus will never fail us. I mean, yeah, he had broken his promise to Jesus, but Jesus hadn't broken his promise to Peter. To love him no matter what, to forgive him no matter what, and to restore him no matter what. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, you can write down Luke 22, verses 31 to 34, and read it on your own. Guys, this goes for every child of God who was unfaithful to their Savior. There is forgiveness and restoration waiting for you. And like Peter, your best days in your relationship with and service for Jesus could be yet future. devil wants to tell you it's over. It's over. You're a lousy Christian. You're probably not even saved. Forget church. Forget the Bible. Forget Christians. And go out and do your own thing. You're a sinner. You'll always be a sinner. You're a loser. You're always going to be a loser. So go out there and just feed your flesh. What more is there? That's the devil. Right? There is forgiveness and restoration waiting for you because Jesus loves you, knew every sin you and I were ever going to commit before he called us and saved us. Nothing surprises him. We act like what we did surprised Jesus. That's why Jesus told Peter, before the night is out, you're going to deny me three times. Not to break Peter. He told him that to give Peter hope. I know what's going to happen, Peter. You think you're going to shock me? But after, but I'm going to pray for you because Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, Luke 22. I'm going to pray for you. And after you're restored, strengthen your brothers because they're all going to be attacked. We use our failures not to lay there and give up. We get up and we use the forgiveness God has shown us to reach out to others going through similar trials, similar uh, areas of sin, and we show them, look, God forgave me. God restored me. He can do that for you. It's not over. Jesus loves you. You can, be, you can come through this a better Christian than you've ever been, more useful to God. Let me end by saying this. This also applies to your marriage. And that, I think, is, is the hidden lesson the Holy Spirit uh, is teaching here. This all can apply to your marriage. Look, I can only imagine the hurt, the heartbreak, and the devastation adultery can bring into a marriage. I've never experienced that in my marriage, but I have counseled many who have. And all I can say is you sit across the table from somebody who has... um, Their spouse has been unfaithful to them. And you see the pain on their face, which reflects the brokenheartedness inside. It says it it all. It says it all. And I know that there are not every divorce, or excuse me, not every act of unfaithfulness is the same as every other act. There are some very... I don't want to oversimplify this. There are some people from the stories I have heard, I think that marriage needs to end. Although, God can do anything. I'm just saying, and again, I don't want to oversimplify. Even though the experience is painful, 
in many respects, the choice is simple. Either you're going to choose not to forgive your spouse and seek a divorce, or you're going to choose to forgive and seek reconciliation and restoration in your marriage. Now, I know one size doesn't fit all. Again, I've heard stories that I can't even believe. But oftentimes, people choose quickly to end the marriage because they're hurt. I understand that. It's about a heartache. And so they really don't want to pray that God would work a miracle. But he can and often does, if we're willing. And if you choose the latter, in other words, reconciliation and uh, restoration in your marriage, if you choose that option, know this. All the grace and strength that you are going to need to see God restore your marriage and heal it. In fact, he's not going to even put it together like a broken glass, gluing it together. What he does is he kind of takes what was and replaces it with something brand new. I have seen marriages that were broken because of adultery. And two Christians will come together and be committed to trusting God to repair their marriage and find out he didn't repair it. He recreated it. And now it's more beautiful than they have ever experienced before there was adultery. Look, if you choose forgiveness over unforgiveness and reconciliation over divorce, you might just find, listen to me, that the best years of your marriage are yet ahead of you. Because with our God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this lesson in this chapter that (laughs) you've kind of hidden alongside this historical narrative. And yet as we, we mine the treasures here we come away with some pretty incredible lessons about a lot of things not the least of which is how you desire to heal marriages and make them even better than they have ever been and so lord we pray that for the marriages in our church and those that lord have opted for divorce we don't want to condemn anyone lord we pray that you would bless their new marriage in a way that is absolutely incredible For those right now who are suffering through a marriage that is very rocky and seems on the verge of collapse, in Jesus' name, minister to these hearts. Fill them with agape love and with a desire not to gravitate towards pride and selfishness, but to become servants to each other, even as you became as our bridegroom a servant to us to the point you died that we might live. And we just praise you, Lord. We thank you. We ask you to keep blessing these final studies in this incredible book for your glory. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.